All right. Who's ready to get started today? Let's do it. You pumped? Sure. Fernando, I, I know your brain's already going through the, the paces today. You're doing a chess game a, a minute ago? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dallas, we got our, our work cut out for us here. We're going to keep up with this guy today. <laughs> yeah, I try to be good at chess, but um, I, I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slow. I, I'm too slow for that, I think. Too slow? <laughs> yeah, I need to practice my... My my speed thinking, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They Fernando might be good at the the one with the timer there. You guys are gonna have to catch out, uh, check out the the Queen's Gambit. Yeah, Queen's uh, great, great series actually. But I I, I usually play this like some called male chess. So I have two days for for each for a move. It, yeah, for move. Nice, nice. Yeah, we've got. Um, We've got a Scrabble board that's like that in the house. Debbie and I play while we're letting the dog out. Uh, <laughs> we, she's she is much better with words than I am, but I'm more of a strategic thinker. So I'm I'm fine giving up a couple pieces if it means that I get that triple word score. So <laughs> make it happen. Awesome guys. So let's go ahead and get started as we we give keep people a couple minutes to to get on here. Um, Let's start with uh, our fun question for the day. And speaking of uh, doing smart things and, and chess, um, if you were uh, thinking about the, the start of COVID here, what is one of the habits that you had when, or that you formed when COVID started and that you wanna keep going forward? Uh, Dallas, you wanna start us off? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, I don't know if it's a habit, but something we're kind of forced to, but uh, now it became really something that is um, easy for me to do. And I don't think I would get adapted is, uh, for example, I, I had my MBA, which was presential, right? So I, I had to go um, uh, to to the school and and everything and now uh of course with covid they they change it to an online format and now i don't think of getting getting back ever to a to a uh you know to a classroom or something like that because uh, i don't know i i got used to to having everything uh online like in terms of educational purposes all at and, your fingertips right yeah that's right uh, I don't know if I would get used to to getting back into a physical classroom again with other people and that kind of stuff. I don't know. It's it it feels weird, you know, like thinking about that. So uh, that's something I will definitely take into consideration when I'm uh, applying for for other um, for other levels of education uh, in my life. You know, are you going for PhD next? Is that Who knows? The plan? Uh, need, need some time, right? <laughs> Just take a breath first. <laughs> I don't know. Dr. Donizetti sounds pretty sweet. <laughs> I have to I have to think about some of that. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. I, I definitely like having things on demand, especially like from a learning perspective, right? Um, there's different universities that have kind of taken that to the next level where basically the entire course is there. Um, I think the only aspect that I get a little concerned about is, is just the community aspect that's at play too, right? Um, so do you feel like your um, university is really providing you with opportunities like that to, to blend and feel part of a, a community um, or part of your cohort? Yeah, I think, I think now, at least now was, as we are, um, uh, we're trying to we're moving forward in terms of uh, being more flexible around, um, you know, getting together and that kind of stuff. Um, I think they are they're promoting more uh, more things like that, like thinking about uh, when we are when we're in a better spot, we at least get together a couple of times and uh, or do hackathons and things like that, you know. 
um, and to to try to engage the community around it. But um, yeah, I think I think I, I also agree with you. I think we miss a little bit of that human aspect of being with other humans around you. Um, and of course, that's that's really important. Uh, but from an educational perspective, I think I, I, I felt better on taking, you know, taking my own, um, let's say my own uh, pace in terms of, of, of the content and that kind of thing, instead of, you know, just sitting in the chair and listening to all of it and trying to absorb that at the same, uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking about other stuff, you know? Yeah. And I think when we kind of talk about that, right, that's no different than like even the Altrix community um, when we're kind of exploring this um, is we really want to make sure that uh, we're engaged in all aspects. So there's those on-demand pieces. Um, there's the chat that exists, right? So you can go in from a community perspective, post your questions. Um, and then the other piece that we got to remember is there's the user groups and stuff, right? Um, so when we talk about those, it's virtual. Uh, we're talking about doing some in-person ones, maybe now in Q4. Uh, mm -hmm. Just sneak one of those in and see how it goes. Um, and maybe it, it's just going to be focused on networking. So when we kind of talk about that, that's one of the, like the old habits that I miss is just being able to get out there and connect with people on an individual level. Uh, we just did that with a virtual office here in uh, Central Florida. And we literally just got together and it just focused on collaboration. And that's part of what I'm seeing in the workplace now, right, is um, if we're going to go to a hybrid schedule and, and for some companies, what are the things that we should be focused on while we're in the office together versus when we're apart, right? And now all of a sudden we actually have a physical distinction between those two. And I think that ties very nicely into our conversation today about Altrix Designer, right? Mm -hmm. So those are like some of the deep think aspects where you get to focus on those uh, problems and stuff yourself and then zoom out. And then how do you collaborate with individuals who may not even be next to you and get to peek over your shoulder all the time to work on a workflow with you? So before we dive into that, Fernando, uh, what what's the new habit that you've kind of formed that you want to keep post COVID? Yeah, I, I think I have two actually. One is related, really, of course, to home office. So working from home for me, it's something that I was really scared to do, mm -hmm. but when I start doing, man, that's that's fantastic actually. So uh, of course, if we think about the social aspect of it, that's not great. But since I wasn't social uh, before COVID, so for, for me, it's it's great. So the only thing that I, I miss the most is so ha having lunch with uh, some friends. But that's something that I, I also tend to, to prefer have lunch by myself. So so that's great for me as well. So but one other thing that I start doing uh, in COVID, actually, I, I, I play chess since uh, eight years old, but uh, I, I stopped, I think, uh, at 15. So when COVID went, and since I, I'm really into sports, I like to play football, I like to to, to go uh, to the gym, to work out. So one thing that I, I needed to do is any sport whatsoever. So I started doing that to, to play chess. So that's one thing that I, one thing to, to keep my mind busy uh, during the, the night, so. Some of the mental exercises, right? Getting yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, and speaking of mental exercises, we've got quite the gauntlet we're throwing down today, right? With some of the, the Altrix stuff. So as we're kind of discussing Altrix as a whole, I think three of the topics that we want to cover today um, are going to be related to um, the Altrix configuration. So like some of our favorite configuration aspects, um, our favorite tools. And then also one thing we wish we had known when we first started uh, with Altrix Designer, right? So um, when we talk about that first one, um, let's talk about the, the configuration. What's something that you uh, think more people need to know about, like your favorite aspect of the configuration in Altrix?
Actually, I can start start with that. So maybe I need to share my screen for this. Sure. It's better for me. Let let me share. I will build something here that's not that that great actually. But the whole idea here is that you know you have a, a big workflow here. So you have a lot of things going on. Of course, that mine here has only a few few tools. But the idea here is that okay, I have a problem here in this specific tool. And then I need to, to find uh, the previous tool to start uh, checking what is really going on. So it's a, a process that was scheduled and I need to check everything that is, is going wrong. Maybe it's something related to the data set. I have no idea. But when we start, uh, the workflow start growing and we start seeing a lot of different uh, containers and we start to, to make the workflow pretty, we start to, to put the connections as wireless it's hard for me to see uh, where everything is going. So if I go, of course, from if with this workflow, I can see that the connection is coming from here uh, to, to the input, but sometimes it's not that clear where the connection is, is going. So the whole idea here is if you actually uh, click on the tool and you have a, a few icons here on the, on the left, you click on the second one navigation and you can see everything that is going on. The, the incoming, the incoming connection and outgoing so you can, only click here and it go directly to, to that tool. So that's something that's it's pretty great. As something that I discovered while I was in a, a big project with more than, than 50, 50 inputs, 50 outputs. Uh, I, 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 it's like more than a thousand tools there. So that's something that really helped me into finding everything that was going on here. So what do you think about that? I love it. I mean, I especially love being able to see like even some of the metadata is available in there, right? So you can tell where maybe that original column came from, from a uh, social perspective, right? So if when we look at that column, um, being able to evangelize some of the metadata, so hey, this formula um, in tool nine is what we're actually looking at maybe on tool 100. And we understand, okay, if there's something going on with that, how how are we able to uh, identify that clearly? And I mean, when we start talking about those different aspects, um, there can be a number of those tools uh, that kind of exist, right? So if we're looking at, at some of those different ones, let me grab a workflow here because there's uh, a favorite aspect that I love to, let me see if I can find a big one. Um, that I love to play with, and that's related to just being able to understand um, what's going on in the workflow and where to find it. So when you hop into a workflow that you're not familiar with, maybe you're collaborating um, with other individuals and you're just trying to understand, okay, where, where does all this uh, data kind of come from? Where should I be finding things? And, oh, I saw this error message in the workflow. Um, where is that kind of coming from? Um, so when we kind of talk about those uh, different aspects, um, those pieces really kind of come into play quickly. And let's see here. And so when we kind of look at this, right, I just grabbed this turbine workflow. So you've got some turbine data here and you've got new parts, right? And let's say uh, in this, we know that we're looking for failure, right? Um, I think when we're looking for this, like in a text document, if I pulled up Microsoft Word down here um, or any of the Microsoft products, right? We all know by default, hey, if I'm trying to find something, I could just hit the control F button. And this is a window that like only pops up uh, whenever you hit control F, right? You can't even find that here. Um, so a, a lot of people miss this one, but what's interesting is you can see that this has the tool names and stuff here, and maybe a lot of people are familiar with this part, right? But what they may not be familiar with is I could come in here and I could type in failure, right? And this is literally gonna comb all of the metadata in the workflow and tell me, hey, what tools actually have the word failure in it? So if I were looking for failure related data, I could isolate, okay, there's asset failure, right? There's major part component failure. Um, 
And then I could kind of track some of this as we're going along and isolate those tools and see, and it'll highlight everything for me, kind of where this is going, right? And I can even see in the score tool, okay, it has some of this going on. And then here's the other part that's exciting about this. You see fine, but then like this is where my mind is blown, replace. So let's say I replace the data source and instead of failure, we were trying to be a little more positive, right? Uh, like potential room for improvement, right? Or uh, maybe there's something else that we could kind of dig into a little, a little further. And a lot of times we'll have a data source that changes and maybe somebody even just does a case sensitivity change, right? So literally I could come in here and say, hey, the new term for failure is going to be lowercase, right? So I could say failure here, and then I could hit replace all, and then, okay, it's gonna replace 24 instances of it being with a capital F and turn it to lowercase f, right? So if I had maybe some discrepancies throughout the workflow, it's gonna go through and fix all of that for me. And literally when Altrix revealed this a couple years ago, I, I cried because there were so many times where <laughs> I had to go through and, like, man, someone thought it'd be a great idea to standardize all of the, the data sources. And then I, I missed uh, ha this capability and was literally having to go through each tool and find that. And like, okay, I, I set it and then I had to hit run again and then just go through and check um, and then just block the outputs until, until I found all that. So that one was really exciting for me to find. And it's kind of buried there by needing to use a hotkey to get it. And literally, you can have this here. Um, and let's let's just say I put no here. I can have it here with a little pin button hidden. And then if ever I need to do it, I can just pull it out, right? So I can click away from that. And then we'll see that kind of go away, right? And we can choose whether or not to see that, um, whether it's there all the time or, or hidden. So yeah. Love that one. Uh, Dallas, what have you got? Oh, you're on mute. Let me see, sorry. <laughs> Let me see if I can share my screen here too so I can uh, show my line of thought here. Okay, so uh, can you guys see it? Can you guys see designer? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I like um, here in the configuration, especially in the one of those configurations that we can set up, is the XML view of the tools, um, and because it makes it makes it yeah, even though like sometimes it's hard to understand the XML structure and um, you know to play around with it because of the tags and everything like that but the, the the nice thing about that is that it makes it so much more flexible for you to do something if you need to like uh especially when you're doing uh you're creating macros or um or analytic apps that you need to modify these tools and uh usually you only you only have something like uh, update value or update value formula or something like that. But if you update the raw XML of the tool uh, and you understand how the XML structure of that tool is built, um, you actually, uh, you, you can do a lot more uh, in, you know, in customizing your macros and your analytic caps if you need to. Uh, and that XML view, uh, of course, you need to enable that. That doesn't come uh, by default, right? But uh, in the user settings, uh, you you can actually uh, enable that. Um, I think it's an advanced here when you can click on here to display XML in properties window. Um, as you can check that, and you'll, you'll be able to see that uh, XML those XML tags here, uh, and when you once you click on any tool you you're, you're messing with, uh, you can actually see the structure. And uh, one of the things that was very useful for me uh, in terms of that um, is um, 
I, I wanted to update a select tool, um, but it was it was really dynamic. I couldn't use the, simply the 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 option to use select select tool mode uh, once you do like a list box or something like that. Uh, so one of the things that I did is um, I um, I was checking the linear regression um, tool. Um, that uses something like that. That uses actually a checkbox to select uh, target variables and, um, and 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 things like that. And uh, I saw an example here where uh, they actually update uh, the XML of the tool, uh, the XML of the select tool here. And if you can see here, uh, there's actually there's a trick here to um, select. Just, just uh, um, change nice. uh, the selected fields, right? Uh, using the XML um, expression here. So you update the XML, uh, the raw XML, the select tool here. Uh, then you can play a lot more with it, make it more dynamic, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, so I think that this is a really great uh, configuration uh, aspect uh, designer of. And it makes it a lot more flexible for you to, to create anything in here. Nice. Yeah, what's some of the coolest things that you've updated using XML? Um, in terms of the tools, you say? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> uh, I think, like, most of them were, were things like, it's not out of the box for you to update a single value. You basically need to create a whole expression inside of your, you need to create new things. Like for example, in this case of the select tool, you don't, you, you, the select tool in the XML view, you just see the, the fields that are not checked, right? So yes. the fields that are actually selected as false in the tag. So the fields that are checked will not show up in there. So mm -hmm. that's something you need to actually insert in the XML uh, in the XML view of the tool. Uh, so you need to create stuff from the data that is coming in uh, to 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 actually modify that tool. So tools that actually need that, like for example, the cross tab tool is something that is very dynamic too. You can play with it in terms of uh, updating that XML and and putting the fields that you want instead of depending on on you know hard code uh, of, of things that you need to hard code in there yeah. so i think more in that way like tools that are really dynamic like the select tool the cross tab tool the, that depend on maybe they, they depend on metadata that is is dynamic right from your workflow that can change at any time so yeah yeah and i think when we talk about being dynamic um Something that a lot of people may ask whenever they saw you share the metadata window or even when I was hitting control F is there's the tool IDs that exist with the tools, right? Um, are those tool IDs dictated by um, the order in which they're in the workflow on or do you guys know where that number kind of comes from? I think that the number comes from, I think it's the way you, you start dragging the the tool to the workflow and it's automatically built, I think. Yeah. I'm not that sure. And if you yeah. want to, to change that ID, you, you won't be able to do it. And that's uh, something that I think as well, I'm not that sure. Yeah, I think, and I think it basically, once you delete the tool, you kind of you kind of skip one one number, right? Yeah. So like you drag the tool to the canvas and you delete it and it was that tool was ID three, you'll never be able to see ID three again. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's gonna start yeah, I think I, I think that's a way for you to check if someone is really working. So if someone says that uh, the, the workflow is really uh, taking a lot of time for, for him to build it, so you can check the IDs and see if he did a lot of deleting there. So it's a good way to, <laughs> to check. <laughs> That's a good idea. I like that yeah. one, Fernando. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, I mean, you may have some creative process and you may be overthinking uh, what to do, right? Oh, this is great. And then kind of uh, go through and delete it. I have a habit of um, running through an idea and I put it on the canvas, right? And put it in a container. And then if I'm like, man, I definitely think I could do this better. 
uh, I'll uh, minimize that particular uh, container or disable it. And then I'll start with my other idea. Hopefully it is better the second time around, <laughs> uh, but it always it doesn't always work out that way. So I try and go through uh, some of those and, and utilize containers in that manner. Um, another one of my favorite things to do is utilize the Explorer box, which is actually one of my favorite tools. Um, are you guys familiar with the Explorer box? I was going to be try to take a look on that now to, to say that I'm familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many no, now, right? I... Like there's 300 tools. <laughs> it's like, how many, how many different ones do we have here? Yeah. So if we're checking out the Explorer uh, box, so obviously we can come up here and, and type in Explorer, right? Um, which is interesting that US Geocoder comes up. Maybe they're, they're talking about you exploring the US or something. Um, but the Explorer box uh, is actually like a little web browser um, that you can embed in Alteryx. And where I like to use this one is from a documentation perspective. And sometimes what I'll even do is once I have some of this documented, right, there may be a specific discussion thread that I may have a question on. Um, even aces have questions, believe it or not. Or uh, my favorite, an idea post, like how can we improve the product? And if I could just have this one extra thing, then I can make this workflow function faster, right? And what you can do is you can have it navigated specifically to that page. And then uh, again, this is interactive. So the advantage here is when you get this set up, um, then we can essentially have that designer location where maybe it's relating to how to use a zip file in a workflow, right? And if this were our question that we had, um, what we could do from this point on is we could then say, okay, now that I understand uh, or need to know how the zip file works, I don't have to go in and unzip the workflow every time. I can literally just use that link um, and make sure that every time I'm able to um, just come straight from a zip file through it. But I may need to know how to do that. And then rather than um, forgetting what I was doing, right, what I could do is literally have a note in there related to that particular discussion thread um, just to make things function a little cleaner. Uh, and then these are also great if you have like a Tableau dashboard. Um, so let's say I had my uh, Tableau portal. Um, let's do, we'll do Tableau public here. Um, so let's say I had, oh, here's one of my favorites here. So Will Jones, let's say one of my uh, Tableau dashboards um, that I was publishing for was actually related to this one then now all of a sudden what I could do is uh, come in here and say, hey, this is, this is beautiful from this perspective, right? I could come in here, hit refresh. Now watch, of course, it's not going to behave when we're, we're working live here today. Uh, I could come in here and then have this dashboard refresh. Um, and then I could recognize whether or not the, the data is live and if it's doing the things that I, I want it to do. Um, I could make this nice and clean in terms of being able to update that on a regular basis. So um, it makes for a nice clean example of being able to embed the dashboards um, and then allow users to kind of see um, especially if you're not going to be the sole owner of this process, um, what is it specifically that uh, that you can garner in terms of insights for the entire analytics process instead of just being focused on the, the dashboard? And that's when it's behaving. So it looks like we've got, we have a little bit of a bug here or uh, something going on with the website. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's a great idea actually. And I also have one one idea related to to DexML that Thales showed. So sure. so one thing that I did with that that workflow that I I, I mentioned with, with uh, 
50 inputs. The idea is that since we have everything on a share folder and we have to, to connect from using a VPN, and every time you click an input tool, since the VPN is not that great uh, for that company, specific company, it, we, we need to, uh, it took like uh, more than a minute for us to connect to that uh, share folder. So the whole idea there is for me, I, I develop a macro uh, that use, uh, it's like a, a lookup table to, to change everything from one month to another. The, the problem there is that uh, we didn't have a standard for the input files. We didn't have any standard whatsoever. So the whole idea is that we needed only now to, to uh, create that new table with the front and two inputs for the fifth inputs. And it's only a matter for, uh, for me to run that, that macro to get all the results. So if I, when I was doing that manually, it took me more than three hours to do so, mainly related to the VPN, it was not a great VPN. So after that, it took only two minutes. So that's a, that's a great idea to use the, the XML. And sometimes it's even easier for you to use the XML to, to update something than to start checking if you have an inside action to a way of building those. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and even when we talk about that broken tools, right? So sometimes you'll get a broken tool. So being familiar with the XML, um, that's a great way to kind of repair um, some of those components. I'll even give a hint to everybody. We ask some of those questions during our interview process. So if you're looking for a job at Data Meeting, that's one of the questions that we ask about is how do you fix broken tools? Because um, a lot of times you may be sharing a workflow with someone, and if they don't have access to that tool, they need to kind of figure out um, what that tool is, et cetera. Um, and that's part of the way of, of kind of discovering that. Um, and then if you do replace those tools on the canvas, um, you lose some of the settings there. So we even want to go back in and, and be able to replace that because it's a new tool ID, right? So we've got to be able to make sure that we're uh, capitalizing on all that. Dallas, what, what's your favorite tool, man? My favorite tool, I would say, well, I have a couple of them, I think, but I guess like one of the, the, the my top favorite is Generate Bros. Uh, and that that's because I think it's uh, it, it, it's an easy tool to create data, I would say. Um, and you don't need any input or anything uh, to work with. Uh, so like if I would just want to create a list of, of anything, I would just, uh, put, um, I would just generate, use the generate tool, rose tool. And it's, it gives me like a data set, uh, out of the box, you know, like I, I don't have to, to create any, uh, complicated loops or anything like that. I think it's easy to configure. I think once you get it, it's easy to configure and you know, like with other tools, you might, you might, you would need to create a, some kind of well, for loop or something like that. If you're programming or anything like that. Yeah. And I think generate the generate rows tool is very useful for that. Uh, and another one is, uh, which is, a um, uh, it, it can be a stupid tool, but a uh, record ID one, I think it's, it's not only useful for creating IDs per se, but uh, for sorting purposes, for join purposes. I mean, I, I can tell you like how many use cases you can you can actually put the record ID into it and and solve like a million problems that that could you know be way more complicated if you didn't have anything to track the the your, your data set, let's say. So yeah, those two tools. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I like the record ID tool idea because whenever we're kind of talking about some of these, we may be inserting into a table, right? And some of them have that um, primary ID where it can be a problem to, to insert into some of those tables. And there's different ways of kind of handling that. Um, but one of the ways that I found is like all the new records need an ID so you can generate that before it goes in. Um, and allow you to insert and kind of consolidate. And then like you were talking about with, with that tool, it actually has, it doesn't always have to start at record ID one. 
um, you can choose what that starting value is. So when we're discussing that, right, if we know how many records are existing in the table or what record ID we want to start it with, then literally what we can do um, is we can use like the XML kind of bringing this full circle, right? We can edit the XML, adjust it, um, or even use like some of the interface components and then embed this in a macro. And then now all of a sudden you have the ability to uh, kind of bring that full circle and uh, tie those all, all in together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as we're kind of talking about um, pulling these all together, uh, I think we've shared a lot of interesting insights in relation to um, different aspects of the platform that we've come to know and love. And when we discuss that, I think one of the important pieces is uh, remembering the people who are, who are just starting out. So if you were just starting out with Alteryx, um, what's one of the things that you wish you had known um, when you first started out? Like either uh, menus, uh, just ways to use designer, I think before before that, Andrew, I would like to to also uh, talk about my favorite tool. I think you you forgot to to ask me, so I'm a bit sad about that. So you you don't want to to know my favorite favorite tool, but that's fine. It may fine. be too good, Fernando. It may be too good. What, what, yeah, what do you got on the docket for favorite tools here? Yeah, actually, I have a, a simple one here, but I have another one. So I think Victor uh, already uh, answered that on the, the LinkedIn. So and nice. it's also mine. It's uh, the formula tool uh, the, because uh, every time I, I always I have some, uh, some quests in the community where I start solving by using rejects or a lot of different tools. And always uh, there is that one person there that solves everything with one function that I didn't know about. One of those, I think that was one related to substring. So there was a lot of ACEs trying to solve. My, my, my solution, I think, went through uh, 30 different tools and was solved by one simple function. That is, it's not, it's not, I'm not lying. So that's, that's really, really true. And one other thing, what one uh, function that I actually discovered recently was related to, to file paths. So we have a function there that you can remove the extension. So it's a, something that we tends to use when start using the directory tool. And I was using regex to remove the extension. And that's something that I, I discover a new function that you can remove dynamically the, the extension as well. But the, the tool that I really like, so one, uh, one that uh, not a lot of people know about is the message tool. And I always mm -hmm. check in with a, a lot of different customers trying to, since you, you have a, a workflow that is scheduled, you don't want to worry about any kind of error or validation. Uh, it's always uh, some kind of, oh, I'm, I'm going to create a, an Excel file with all the all the data coming from this left left output anchor from a join tool and then i'm gonna send that to to someone but the whole idea is that we can use the message to to give an error there so if if you have any kind of data or if you have uh, a specific number inside uh, a column that's something that you can use the message to, to give a message or to give an error as well so that's something that i, I really like and yeah and i think when we kind of talk about messages, they're important and there's a lot of functionality within single tools. So like one of the messages that I, I like to share is um, you can even create your own formulas. Did you did you know that? Actually, to, to save expression, the uh, expression? I, I, I know that, but I don't know how to create them. <laughs> <'Cause I'm> not, <laughs> so there, uh, there's actually... I'm, yeah, tell us. I'm not ahead. that good. I'm not that good in C++. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's actually a couple different ways, Fernando. So there's saving the expression, right, where maybe we know uh, the column names, right? Uh, and then you've got that little folder, which will save across workflows. So if you have a common expression, you can um, get that information in there. Um, and that's an easy way, like, especially when we're doing summarizations or uh, different things, um, you can allow yourself to, to kind of capitalize on maybe those common fields. And then the other piece that's also exciting 
is uh, what we just shot out there in the chat is the abacus add-in. So that's what Thales was relating to. Literally under the hood, you can add in new formulas. So then it will even use like the the autofill or the auto text, which I've never tried that with a, a saved uh, expression, if it will populate one of those, that would actually be pretty cool is if you started typing that, it would say, oh, did you mean this formula? So we can just go ahead and put that in for you. But the abacus one will literally do like if you have uh, financial calculations, they have a lot of those in there. And that's from James Dunkerley. Um, he went through and he created a bunch of different formulas in C++ um, to kind of show um, different ways of creating uh, calculations. And then now you can literally just download that as a plugin and add all those additional expressions to your Alteryx instance. So it's pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know about that, actually. I know one really useful is uh, actually getting the, the business days yes. uh, difference. Because uh, I know that that's not something out of the box there in designer so i think he created a formula that uh you could actually do that cal make that calculation easily uh, yeah we had like when i used to work for universal we had entire workflows dedicating dedicated towards building calendars mm -hmm. so like what quarter is it what month is it what day of the week right and then even starting the day of the week, because you may have a fiscal calendar, which is different than um, the traditional calendar. So how do you isolate some of those uh, instances? And this uh, can allow you to grab those different date parts and then just use a single equation instead of having to tier it or do some extra logic. And then it looks like we have um, Shokat here saying, um do we have anyone who likes the block until done tool yeah actually that's that's one of the greatest tool there so if you uh, i think i i showed in a previous session there one way of it's one workflow using the block until done so if you have for, for example you are trying to play, create a lot of different sheets inside one the same excel file that's one way for you to do it so it's it's a great tool actually I I have some considerations around that tool because it doesn't always work as you expect. Uh, but I think it's I mean for those use cases, those simple use cases, it's it's useful because there is the parallel block until done. There is uh, the crew macro, right? That is, I think it's more useful because then you you can um, easily. Uh, control two two streams of of of, of data um and um like you can actually do like a um you know like parallelism in terms of processing the data so but but the black until then is is useful it just i just still think that it needs some improvements to to get to a to a point where we can uh, do more of ETL uh, or anything like that in inside our trades. Nice. Yeah, and I think I'm on the same page with you. I, I prefer the parallel block until done just because that tends to be more uh, centered around the, the use cases. Um, mm -hmm. But I think when we kind of talk about that, it really depends on the data set you're working with. Um, Brian, made an awesome point as well earlier with the, the cache data, right? So when we talk about uh, accessing your data faster or writing it out to different locations, you may need some practice kind of working with some of these things. So doing the cache data sets is a, is a great way of kind of doing that. And that's simple. It's just right click and then it's three quarters of the way down on the menu. Um, and remember that it's going to be all tools with a single output um, that you can do that with. Um, and then you can still go in, it'll have like the little gray message just as a warning on all the tools that are behind the bubbles. Um, you can still look at those menus, but if you do any changes, it's going to wipe the cache and you have to rerun it. So, uh, and then Shokat also brought up the generate role tools 
um, to create calendar tables. So I think this almost ties in, Dallas, with what you were saying earlier about, hey, we can use it to create new data. And then what I had mentioned about being at UO, that's actually part of the way that we created those tables. Um, it was before Abacus came out. Um, so we created a bunch of formulas that we used, and then we would use the Generate Rows tools um, to generate that calendar and then populate that into a database table um, that a majority of the organization was using. Yeah, what other, do you guys have any other, any other questions from the audience that um, you'd like to, to ask? or interesting tools or questions relating to um, Altrix Designer? I guess the, the thing that, uh, the topic that we, uh, we were discussing before um, related to things that I wish I knew um, uh, yeah. when I was beginning with Designer. Um, you know, like, actually there are a lot of things that I still discover with, with uh, with the tool, right? We we never stop learning because the tool is, is so the platform is so uh, is so big and, and so many things. But I would just say, like um, in the past, I used to put my outputs in in uh, in containers, especially when I was writing to a database because of development, right? And uh, you know, like I when I found out that you could just disable all all of the output tools, I was like. Wow, why why was I spending so much time creating all of those containers? You know, like that was uh, that was really something that uh, helped me with the with the development. Uh, and it's it's such a it's such an easy thing. Another thing is the debugging mode when you're uh, developing an analytic app. Yeah, so that that that's something that also I I when I was first uh, creating my my analytic apps, I was like. I don't know what the heck is going wrong wrong with my app, right? What why is it not working as I expect? And I would run the app and I would not get the output that I desired. So when I started using debug mode, it was like, you know, I was like I was in heaven. Yeah, it was it was a piece of cake, right? It was, uh, it was really easy to understand what was going on with uh, my action tools, what what was actually um, doing in terms of my selections and my my interface and everything because basically generates a workflow with all these updated values and then uh, that made a lot they, that made my life a lot easier too so a lot of people don't know that this debug mode exists but it does exist in the interface designer uh, menu and use it use in a in a fuse right uh, <laughs> uh, yeah because it's 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 really, it's really useful, I, I would say, in terms of development. Yeah, and I noticed that when you had your screen pulled up as well, you had debug at the top. You're going to share with everybody how you get the, the debug mode up at the top? Yeah, yeah. Like you say, let me see. Um, when I was uh, actually doing that, right, I, I brought the linear regression tool and I open it and uh, I open the uh, the interface designer menu um, and then the debug mode you can see it and you're seeing like uh, your app your or your app your macro here you can open the debug here you can actually uh, uh, select a few values here and see how they modify your workflow. Mm -hmm. uh, in your app or something that you're developing. So I, I would say it's more useful for apps because you can see or apps, you can actually see what you're executing, right? A macro is just a, is just a sample workflow that you develop for um, to, to repeat a process, right? So uh, it's more useful when you have a, I think it's more useful when you're developing an app that debug mode, but it, it does, it, it's, it's very useful. Once you do that, uh, it usually opens a, a different workflow here um, with a, will, will be called the debug workflow uh, with the updated values. So no interface tools and just 
just the workflow with the update values. Um, yeah. That that that's really useful. Yeah, and I think when we kind of talk about some of this, there's been some new menus coming online as well. So let's see if you guys knew about this one. So if you click um, options here, which I don't know if it'll come up with you for you on this one. Here, I can, I'll share my screen. Can you share? Just... Yeah. So this is actually related to uh, 21.2. So you can see Altrix HTML developer tools, right? So you can see I've got a window that popped up here. So where did this window come from? Um, so when we're looking at this, right, I had a workflow here. And in this situation, I knew this tool has HTML. And this is the intelligence suite set here, right? But if I grab this tool and drag it here onto the canvas, it's literally going to pop up. So if I wanted to understand how this tool is built, if you're trying to take your skills to the next level, you can kind of do that here. And where you locate that and kind of get it turned on, if you wanted to see those as advanced options, and you've got some new windows here. So show HTML developer tools. And I have this one checked, right? The locked workflow, um, if you were used to encrypted workflows before, that's uh, the same button here. And they've kind of slowly been going through and adding more uh, menu options and stuff here. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, even as ACES, we've got to go through and, and check different menus because they change over time and they're, they're not always in the release notes. Um, so just kind of keep uh, some of those pieces in mind as you're, you're working through this. And Victor also called out um, the uh, multi-row uh, tool as well. So when we're we're looking at a uh, variety of these, right, um, I definitely recommend checking out the, the multi-row tool. So this is another one when we're talking about uh, creating those uh, formulas with the record IDs. So you can even do record IDs there, especially if you want it in batches relative to um, like a specific grouping. Right. So when you look at the multi row tool and we open an example, there may be um, some specific batches that you're working with um, that you want to work around. So you see this grouped record ID. Right. So exact scenario worked in here. So you can see there's a product and then we want to do uh, row minus one record and then do the record ID. Right. Um, so this is a great way of kind of. Uh, accessing that and we can see okay for product a it went up to um, all the way up to 30 and then we started on product B and then we got the next one going so there's all these different menus that exist here um, at varying levels and something else that I saw in yours Talis um, that is is always in there is there's this little package right um, that we have in here on some of the windows so if ever you're uh, creating a data set, oh, look, we even get to see this is HTML everywhere here. So we get to realize how much HTML is actually in Altrix. Um, we may be looking at like a YXDB, right? Um, and let's just do test one here. And what you'll notice once this is created, um, if we go here over to the assets, it's going to auto detect and then you can see some of the assets here. So this is important to understand, like whenever you're packaging workflows, collaborating with others, do they have the files? Or are they local? Um, you may want to look at a specific tool to do that. And this goes back to that same window that Talos had up a minute ago where he was kind of talking about um, advanced options here. And you've got display XML properties and then display asset manager. And if you're like me, who's horrible at saving, the other one that I love is um, obviously uh, auto recovery and auto saving. So if you're doing crazy stuff, um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll shrink this down to like every two to three minutes, right? And then at least you know if anything crashes, et cetera, then you have the ability to recover that. And then how many files are you have the ability to recover. So you've got full flexibility here to 
kind of edit edit these on your own. And then even your undo level, if you're you're crazy and um, you're throwing so many tools on the canvas and deleting them to get past Fernando's uh, uh, tracker for uh, efficiency there. So we've got some some cool stuff. Yeah, and um, talking about the asset manager, um, Andrew, that that is really important when you're um, sharing a workflow with nested macros. So yes. you basically have to go inside every macro and um, pack it as an asset of of that nested macro you have it. So yeah, that's that's a that's a, actually a, some something boring to do, but uh, it's 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 needed if you if you want to share the whole the whole thing. If you have like a macro inside a macro inside a macro, especially if those uh, iterative iterative processes, uh, they usually depend on, on on batch macros on other other loop macros let's say and um you have to pack it inside of of each one uh until until you reach the top and then when, once you share that workflow even with the gallery or uh exporting as a package then you you will be sharing everything you're not you don't miss any nested macros you might have inside your workflow yeah, and I was hoping I had one just like laying around handy, but I think <laughs> one of the the fastest ones that we can kind of reference is like any of the um, predictive tools kind of have some of this going on, right? So you've got like the ANOVA tables and stuff in here. Oh man, all right, this is getting a little annoying. Let me kill this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's taking it too far. All right, there we go. So here you literally have it here and you can... Uh, check some of this out here because you'll have assets and you can see whether or not they're properly packaged here. And so if ever you were getting any error messages here, whenever you uploaded it to the server, um, you could understand whether it's auto detected, right? And then if you did want to handle these in bulk, um, there's a workflow dependencies window that's also here. So this will literally list out, let's go, we'll go back to this other workflow as an example. So if we go to workflow dependencies here, it's going to show all the pathing. And then you have the choice here. So we could switch to all relative pathing, right? We could do absolute. It's going to show us the different paths here. And then we could, let's say this were a network path, we could even do all UNC. And then we can test to see if that works, right? So it's going to highlight for you. This one's good. These other ones, not so much. And then if you're doing that prior to uploading your workflow to share it to the server or with other people, then this is going to provide you a nice, clean way of, uh, of working and collaborating together. So, yeah, looks, look, looks like we're at time here, guys, for a designer. Um, if you love this session, please feel free to, to share it with your friends. Um, Dallas, Fernando, you've got any uh, last minute notes here for for everyone before we close out. Yeah, I think it was great that I didn't have time to, to answer mine here because uh, I think that this has hacked my mind here and answered two of mine. And then I started digging more to, to see if I had anything else to show. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'm going to show the, the dependency. And, and then you just show that. So <laughs> I, I, I had nothing else to, to show here. Nothing else? Oh, man. <laughs> what's, what's something that, I mean, you, you really wish you knew like whenever you first started I'll, I'll challenge you so what's something you wish you knew about inputs or output tools when you first started um i, I actually one thing related to, to the csv file so since you have that field length and there are a lot of yeah. errors going on there and it's really hard for for you to discover at the first glance so that's one thing that i wish i knew because it took me hours to, to discover that no oh, man, that's that is a good one. I, I think we we miss a lot of data that way, right? Especially exactly. depending on where you got the file. Some of them I've worked with some that are like two thousand or three thousand characters long, and like you'd have no idea that there's extra data there until you exactly. get it, get to visualizing it or something, right? Awesome. That yeah, I, I I the only thing I was, I was gonna say is. Uh, if you guys are not aware of our server series that is coming up, please check that because, uh, yeah, you can 
I think you guys can learn a lot from server, especially those who just have a de designer background, just want to uh, learn more about the basics of server, what server is for and what we can, uh, what kind of tasks we can, we can do a server, how server is structured and everything like that. I think we're going to talk a lot, a lot more about that, right? In our server series, Andrew. Yeah. And I think that's really why we were saving Fernando from the questions here is because he's got <laughs> a lot of talking to do the next uh, seven weeks, seven weeks, guys. I think, exactly. well, I guess I should do it the opposite way. Right. So <laughs> it shows up on the screen, right? So seven weeks uh, and it's covering, as Talos was saying, everything from the basics all the way to um, two new cool additions that we're adding on, which are uh, chained applications and the Altrix Gallery API. So I think we're, we're really excited for that. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, and happy Tuesday. And we can't wait to see you guys again next month. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Have a good one.